and Ren Weichman. Woo! And they're off. Go. Oh my gosh, Dom is in the lead position. Let's see, we got Dom, it looks like we got Brendan Schurmeyer, and then it looks like we got Ren and Angel. That all these racers were fast. I knew they were talented, very skilled. And so for me, going into this, the main thing I wanted to know was, where do I stack up? Like, am I, can I hang with them, or am I not even on their level? I don't know. Today's show is going to be a little bit longer than normal, but I think you're going to enjoy it as we learn more about Ren Weichman. Find out the common themes that tie all of Ren's interests, from one wheels, to drones, to acting, to directing. If you spend any time on YouTube, you've probably seen his videos. I think it's ready. This is the world's first real working lightsaber. You guys ready to make history? Yeah. Three, two, one. Oh. Lame. Oh. 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 All right guys, I've finally done it. I have built the world's largest laser gun. Three. Oh, hold on, hold on. Wait, glasses, 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 glasses. Two. Oh. 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 oh my God, it's hot. Friend, what's going on here? We are moments away from the world's biggest domino We're gonna run. We're going to do it, dude. Yes, this is my life's greatest achievement. Gonna, guys, I've done it. I've made the world's bounciest pogo stick. Check this out. Oh, man. I have built the world's largest slingshot here. Check wow. I love the passion that Ren has for his work, and this interview was a fun one. I hope you enjoy it. Let's get started. I was watching Race for the Rail, the live stream, and uh -huh. uh, I was joining in on that chat on the side, you know, when you watch a live stream, and I couldn't help but notice the overwhelming support there was for Ren. Um, yeah. Go Ren, <laughs> I'm only here to see Ren, I'm here for Ren. And I'm like, who the heck is Ren? And uh, so how do you answer that question? Who the heck is Ren? Wow. Uh, well, first off, it was, it was, I mean, regarding that, it was very cool to see all that support, but also part of me was kind of embarrassed because I'm like, oh man, all these people showing up to watch me and I, I flunked out of the race in the first minute. <laughs> yeah. What do I say to that? Well, uh, my name is Ren. I am a content creator on YouTube. I do all kinds of different stuff. Started off as making short films with a specialization in like visual effects and whatnot, just like creating stuff that's in my imagination and just trying to make it a reality. And then the longer we kind of did that, uh, so I, I became a part of Corridor Digital way back in the day, like 2012. I've been with Corridor for like eight years now. Okay. And yeah, it was just short films with special effects for the first several years. But a few years ago, we, we started kind of transitioning into doing more, more uh, frequent upload vlog type content. And then from there, it kind of just expanded into a whole bunch of different things. I've got a bunch of different shows that I work on now. Everything from, we have this uh, pretty popular series on our channel called v Visual Effects Artists React, where we basically just kind of break down how effects and movies are made. Mm -hmm. And we also, I personally do a lot of DIY type project builds and stuff like that. Like, uh, it's no longer put together, but I built a Nerf drone. So this is like the thing that went on top of my drone. My drone's over there. That's right, uh, that was you versus Jan, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so, like, I do all kinds of, like, projects that, you know, I, I don't really know what I'm getting into, but, because uh, I have an engineering background. I should also mention that. I got a degree in mechanical engineering, and so I've been able to, like, kind of carry that through my visual effects journey and kind of, like, bring it back. So now, basically, what I do is I just, I try to make stories and, and, and videos that are interesting to watch for anyone, um, whether that's science type education, like how can I bring a concept that is not hard to understand, but might be a little misunderstood? Sure. How can I flesh that out more? Or like some, yeah. Well, I'll be honest, I had to look you up um, during that race for the rail. And, All right. uh, and then I discovered um, that you're the guy from the corridor channels that my son loves to watch. And then I, I, I've seen a bunch of your videos, I think starting with the uh, Super Mario um, Eastgate video. Uh, yeah, think, okay. I, I saw that years ago. And I was like, yeah, thank cow, you. this is the guy. And that was amazing. I was like, that, that, was, <laughs> that was amazing back then. It's still amazing today. And that, that was a big passion project back then. Tell us your one wheel origin story. Well, it's like, how far back do we want to go? Should we go all the way back to when I was in high school and my sister got an little electric uh, scooter sure. and I didn't? <laughs> but fast forward years and then the boosted board comes out and I thought that was the coolest thing I'd ever seen in my entire life and I wanted it so bad, but I couldn't afford it. They were really expensive. They were like 1500 bucks a piece. We ended up doing that Mario Skate video where we got some boosted boards for that, so that was amazing. And so that was kind of like my daily driver for a couple years was uh, just, or not even one or two years were the boosted boards and I had seen the one wheel online and I thought, you know what, that looks pretty sweet and I eventually ended up ended up getting it and uh, 
I haven't looked back. So I got it in like <laughs> early 2016. And at the time, I still kind of thought the boosted board was superior as a writing device. Sure. And because I was like, it can go faster, it can go further. Until one day I discovered that it could not go further than the one wheel. Because there's uh, this place that I would go to that would just barely stretch the limits. Uh, or rather, I would just barely be able to make it back on that trip on the boosted board. And then one day I did it on a one wheel and got back with like plenty of room to spare. And that was like, that was the defining day. This, I'd had the one wheel for a few months at this point. But that was like the day that I actually became a convert to one wheel. I was like, all right, I'm not ever touching the booster board again. Why? <laughs> the one wheel is more fun and it goes further. That's and ever right. since then, it's all been about like, how can I go further <laughs> on a one wheel? I think it's a pretty unified feeling that we want to be able to go further because we don't want to get off. <laughs> That's right. You just want to keep riding. That's the holy grail with the one wheel. Um, yeah. Range. So you are a YouTuber, an engineer, a VFX artist, an actor, a director, a drone pilot, pilot, a TED Talk speaker, a husband, <laughs> an elite yes. one wheel racer. Is there anything that I missed? <laughs> uh, no. Uh, I think you hit everything. Okay. I don't, uh, okay so that you're sounded pretty me, cool when you say it out loud like that. Uh, going back to race for the rail. Um, and for those not, uh, not familiar with that, what that is, it's the official one-wheel race. And this year they invited uh, the elite one-wheel racers to come and, mm -hmm. uh, and compete. I mean, these were some of the best one-wheel riders around. Um, what were some of your thoughts that were going through your head when you were selected as one of the racers? Uh, well, the thought that was going through my head when I was actually selected was, okay, this is happening. Time, time to do this. Because I... I... I felt reasonably confident that I was going to be selected as a wild card because it was essentially like put up to public vote and I just like basically spammed my Instagram feed. I threw it up on Reddit. I was like, hey, vote for me. I want to get into this because it's important to me. And that was the thing. It's like as long as I can get into that, that initial screening of making it through that process of future motion because I don't think they anticipated me making an entry mm -hmm. and then once I got – once they – once I submitted one – they selected it, so that was great. Uh, I felt like I put together a pretty good video. It was basically just me. I was like, okay, you had to show speed, skill, and heart. And so I thought, okay, what better than to race down this technical fire road trail wearing a suit and drinking tea out of a out of a saucer. Like, it requires skill to like not spill all that. Uh, and it ended up, the final video ended up just kind of being goofy and silly rather than like showing did, the tech. Did you have your finger up? Did you have your finger up? Oh yeah, up? oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and, but yeah, so that got through in that and they selected me uh, to be part of the big group and then from there, that's when I was like, okay, I don't think anyone else on this list has the following I do. I, I feel reasonably certain that I can get in. Okay, but then after, did. after you were selected, I mean, what were your thoughts then? I mean, you were going to be going up against some of the best racers. So yeah, that was the thing. For me, I, I I was aware of each one of these racers. I'd only met some of them. Like I'd, I'd met Bodhi a couple times, and he's a super cool dude. But most of the others, uh, I either knew from afar or had chatted with online. Like I'd been chatting with Jeff McCosker uh, on Instagram and whatnot. And I've been chatting with these guys for quite a while, but I'd never met them in person. And I'd only seen them just doing insane stuff on YouTube. And I knew I couldn't do the tricks that they could, but... I, I've gotten really into like going fast on trails. Like that is my bread and butter is like trail riding. And that, that is what I do all the time. And so I, going into this whole thing, I knew that all these racers were fast. I knew they were talented, very skilled. I knew that I was talented and skilled as a one wheel rider, but I didn't know how that actually stacked up at the end of the day against the world's fastest racers. I didn't know. And so for me going into this, the main thing I wanted to know was, where do I stack up? Like, am I, can I hang with them or am I not even on their level? I don't know. There's some uncertainty because the other racers don't know who I am, uh, apart from, you know, by reputation from the fact that I have this online personality, but you know, they don't know how fast of a racer I am. I don't know how fast of a racer I am compared to them. We're all gonna find out how this is because you know, I, I'm sure there are probably a few uh, racers that were a little salty that, you know, they probably deserve to be with this elite group of racers, and yet they didn't get into it because they didn't place in the top seven of times last year, and sure. they didn't have enough of a uh, following to win this popularity contest that I was able to this year. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and, and, and so there's a lot of pressure, at least, that I was putting on myself. Like, I got to earn the spot that I've now come in and taken 
Like, I, I can't I can't do that and come in here and get last place every race. So that was my only thing. I wanted to not get last place, and I wanted to actually, as a reach goal, actually do really well. And so that was going into this whole tournament, kind of my, uh, that was my mindset. How did you feel with your performance at Race for the Rail? Well, I think it's important to note that there were four different races at this entire event, culminating with the actual Race for the Rail on the final day. And the, the first day there were two races, the second day there was one race, and the third day was the big Race for the Rail. So the first two events I, I did okay in. I, did, I didn't get last place on the second. The second race was like a qualifying time trials thing. Everyone r raced individually and got their own times, and that uh, dictated where you sat in the bracket for the final race. And my time was like ninth place out of 12 people. So I wasn't last, but I also was like more than a minute away from the other racers who I was hoping to be in league with. So after that day, I was just like, I was starting to not feel too good about myself. I was like, man, I really don't deserve to be here. That sucks. But then the next day I turned it around and we had a relay race where again, every racer was measured on their time trial um, time through this, through this track. And I ended up placing fourth place rather than ninth. And so the only three people who beat me were Dom, Bodhi, and Tahoe Dave. And I managed to have, I, I, I beat other people. I beat Jeff's time. I beat wow. uh, Floaty, the guy yeah. who won the entire race for the rail. Yeah. Uh, granted, these guys, they'll claim that, you know, oh, they were holding back because they didn't want to like crash and burn, uh -huh. <laughs> which is probably true to a certain degree. But at the same time, we're all going on the same trail and we're all pushing it. And so that was enough for me. I was like, okay, I do deserve to be here. I can hang with these people. And that was like a big moment for me because I was like, okay, yes. I don't care how the actual final race of the rail goes because I, I proved to myself that I deserve to be here. So that's enough for me for now. At what point did you feel like you could say you're a legit VFX artist or you're a, a real actor or you're uh, a, a, a certified Never. director? <laughs> Never. <laughs> I, 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 the way I see it is... Um, I get better at visual effects every year, and I will never consider myself a master. There's always new things to learn, especially with the, the industry changing as much as it does every year. New technologies come out. You know, the past year or two, a big, big push in like, uh, like AI-driven effects. Uh, deep fakes are a big one that have been coming out over the last year or two that have been really getting, kind of getting more and more advanced. So there's always new things to learn, always new, new paths to take. So... I mean, yeah, there. Even even people who are really good at what they do can always improve, and so that's how I always try to maintain my perspective on on stuff like that. You mentioned uh, deep fake. Can you explain that really quick? Because uh, I'm a Keanu Reeves fan. And I was like, what the heck is this? And I, for a while, I thought it was real. But uh, let's okay. tell, me, tell us about deep fake. It's essentially you train this AI to understand how a face looks under a bunch of different lighting conditions, a bunch of different angles. And then you also train it to understand how a different face looks bunch, across a bunch of different lighting uh, angles and, and angles of the face, stuff like that. And so it kind of trains itself on how to replicate that and then merge them together. So what you do is you could take the face of another person as long as you've trained the AI on what that face looks like and it'll actually recreate it and retarget it to another face that you upload. If you can nail the voice, the mannerisms, the like the, the overall look and the head shape, then actually replacing the face, suddenly it comes together as like a real person. Like, oh wow, this is actually Keanu Reeves. Um, and there's a lot of like moral gray area when it comes to doing that sort of thing. Like, is this okay? Like, <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't exactly have Keanu Reeves' permission to do this. Uh, and who knows? Maybe it wasn't okay. We'll find out in time. How have you been able to change course and reinvent yourself? I never actually went into a career for engineering. I got the degree and immediately pivoted towards doing YouTube full time and just trying to make video content. And very soon after that, I joined up with uh, Corridor Digital and kind of became part of that crew. So I never got to actually exercise my diploma that I got because I had started doing visual effects while I was in college, just as a hobby. And but I was so passionate about it that that hobby very quickly became a, a very skilled hobby of mine that I was I was able to get kind of get pretty good at. I wasn't just doing visual effects. I was actually making short films, and that includes everything from directing and actually shooting with a camera, knowing the camera settings, cutting it together, getting you know sound design in there, music in there, color grading, making sure you have some cohesive plot or story, even if it's a simple story, and then uh, seeing that through to the end. And so that was one of the things that 
caught you know Sam and Nico's eye from Corridor Digital. They're like, okay, you're able to do that sort of stuff. You now live in LA. Come do that stuff with us. We'll work together. And the upside of creating YouTube content is that you don't really have a boss in the greater sense of you know like you know the man, right? And so over time, we were able to experiment with what kind of content do we want to make. And that has given me a lot of personal freedom to explore all these other passions that I have, you know, about drones, about one wheeling, about building things, about visual effects or whatever. And I found a way to basically explore those passions by making videos around them to justify the time spent on those things. Because it's like, you know, I spent so much time making that Nerf drone, like, a couple hundred hours probably <laughs> all said and done and it's like if I was doing that in my free time just on evenings and, and weekends like that would probably take several months of just all my free time but because I was able to justify a video around it I was able to squeeze all that time that most people would have to use on the weekends or whatever into a shorter amount of time because we're making a video for it and so because of that I'm able to do more things and experiment with more passions and kind of dive into different areas that like oh that's that I find that interesting I'm going to do a super deep dive into that for a little bit. Yeah, you're into those uh, EUCs and stuff now too. <laughs> I am. Yeah, the EUCs are a ton of fun. I mean, I, I was watching your Gizmo uh, duck. Uh, not Gizmo. Yeah, Gizmo duck. Yeah, yeah. Gizmo duck. Um, I, I've Ducktales. I watched that a, a ton when I was a kid growing Same. up. But um, I was like, this would have been so much easier if he was on a one uh, on an EUC. So I thought about that too, and I, I've gotten a lot of comments about that over the last couple of years since that video came out. Uh, one we didn't have one so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we use what, what you have but secondly it's a lot harder to stand still on an EUC that's true once you stop and there's a lot of shots yeah. where it's like you pull up to a stop and you kind of just have to like stop there and wait and it's that's something you can pretty easily do on a one wheel mm-hmm. and as long as you twist your body forward you still kind of have the same sort of motion but technically gizmo duck is closer to riding an EUC than a one wheel yeah I, I, I understand that <laughs> <laughs> that's right you've got the personality and uh, the the interests of kind of like a mark rober adam savage uh, bill nye science guy kind of like mash you just said three of my favorite people thank you <laughs> <laughs> i go down to southern california often so i don't know if you ever do group rides i'd love to ride with you in the future let's do it absolutely awesome thanks man i appreciate it thanks for having